So my name's Erin Liddell, and I work at a company called H2O AI, which is in Mountain View, California. Um, I'm the maintainer of the H2O R package, which is a um, platform for doing a bunch of machine learning uh, with the goal of being a highly scalable machine learning system. Um, but today I'm going to talk uh, not necessarily about H2O, but just about automatic machine learning in general, and then how to, uh, how to build and how to benchmark auto ML systems, because that's what I spend most of my time doing these days. OK, so this is just a little overview of what I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to explain, in my opinion, what, what auto ML is, and then um, just talk generally about machine learning benchmarking and what the goals are, and then how benchmarking is used in automatic machine learning development, or at least how I'm using it. Um, <clears throat> And then I'll present a system that uh, me and several collaborators, some of whom are in this room, um, wrote for benchmarking uh, auto ML systems and present some results. And the slides are at this link here. Uh, so if you want to get a copy, I also tweeted them just before this. So if you can't remember that link, you can find them on Twitter. OK, so what is auto ML? Um, we heard a little bit kind of a reference to it in the first talk. So I think some of the goals of AutoML is just training, you know, trying to get the best model in terms of model performance in the least amount of time. At least I think that's a, a um, succinct goal of AutoML. And some other um, features or goals are <clears throat> reducing the human effort and expertise required in machine learning. So rather than being an expert on every single algorithm and all their hyperparameters and the ranges that you should use and how to tune them, um, the goal is to kind of make a more simple interface and um, simple modeling process. Um, and if we, if we do that, then hopefully across the board, we'll improve performance of, of machine learning models that are being trained um, and kind of create a baseline for that. So that's the next point. So I think also AutoML is good for establishing a baseline. If you're, you know, have a new data set and a new use case, and you want to just, you know, see see where you can get with an AutoML system, it's a it's a good first step just to run an AutoML tool on your data, and then from there, if you want to try to improve the models, um, then that becomes your your process. Okay. So a little bit about <clears throat> how I categorize the different parts of AutoML. So the, this is kind of the different parts of machine learning in general, but um, you can kind of divide things up into data preparation, uh, model generation, and then it's this last one is, is sort of optional, but if your goal is to get the best results, then generally an ensemble is, is how you do that. So what does that mean? So for data preprocessing, that could inc include all sorts of things. Um, some basic stuff like imputation, I would call that data preprocessing. Um, different type of encodings, like one-hot encoding or standardization when you need that in certain algorithms. Um, <clears throat> could also include feature selection or feature extraction. And um, a, actually, a really important piece, I think, in terms of gaining more performance in your models is how you process your categorical features, and especially if you have um, high cardinality categoricals, because that can cause a lot of issues in machine learning algorithms, and most software is not designed to uh, handle those situations well, so you have to do some pre-processing on your own to encode categoricals in different ways. And there's a lot of different ways to do that. There's simple methods, and then there's more complicated methods. Um, I'm not going to go into a whole lot of detail, but these are all things that, that could be automated, um, and so it's important to to include them in the, the process here. So then <clears throat> once your data is kind of in a reasonable shape for doing machine learning, then um, you might end up wanting to train a large number of models, because you don't know really in advance which algorithm or which hyperparameter settings are going to uh, be the best. So you end up kind of generating a lot of models, and there's different ways to go about doing this. Um, probably the most common way that you might have heard of would be grid search or random search. And then there's uh, more advanced techniques like Bayesian hyperparameter optimization for tuning models. Um, and then for ensembles, um, there's, there's a number of different ways that you can ensemble models. Um, probably my favorite way is stacking. So we, in, the, in the previous talk, we, 
there was a package called Super Learner. That's uh, what, I'm, what I'm talking about um, in terms of stacking, stacked ensembles. Um, and then uh, there's another technique called ensemble selection, which is more of a greedy approach. So you either take you know, all the models that you have and um, successively remove some from the ensemble and basically stop whenever it, uh, your performance degrades too much, or the reverse, you can iteratively add models into an ensemble and see, um, uh, basically stop when it, when it stops improving the performance. So these are all just different things. So all of this stuff is pretty straightforward. It takes a lot of time. So um, if you're going through this whole pipeline of data science or machine learning, you have to do all this stuff. And depending on what software you're using, it could require writing quite a lot of code. So I think one of the other <laughs> nice things about AutoML is it does it removes all the coding, basically, that you have to do over and over and over again. Um, you know, maybe it's fun the first time or when you're learning how to do machine learning, how to do all these things. But um, once you know how to do it and it's just a matter of copy pasting code over and over, it's, it's nice just to have kind of a wrapper function that will do all this stuff for you. And <clears throat> I'm just going to mention this blog post. So this is a, a blog post that I wrote, I think it was in August, and it's just kind of explaining all the different types of AutoML. So probably in this audience, the, the type of uh, machine learning that you're most used to is dealing with tabular data. So but there's also you know image classification, text classification, more um, complex data types. So uh, you can kind of def def um, divide up machine learning, at least in my opinion, into like tabular data and algorithms that work well with that, or these other types of data, which usually means you're using some sort of deep learning. So AutoML in deep learning looks very different than AutoML in, um, I don't know what we call it these days, non-deep learning, traditional machine learning, or statistical machine learning. So if you're interested in understanding all the different um, types of AutoML, this is a post that you could read. OK, so then machine learning benchmarking. This is something that I've been interested in for a long time. Um, <clears throat> so um, what is this? So basically comparing models, uh, model and runtime performance of different machine learning tools. So I think about it as comparing software packages. You could also think about, uh, about it as comparing different algorithms. But I think the implementation is, is quite important. So when I'm looking at comparing things, I'm comparing software packages, not necessarily algorithms. Um, and so why do we want to do this? Because it's helpful when you're choosing a tool to know, you know, is this tool going to meet my needs and how does it compare to this other tool? Because there's always some sort of investment that you're making when you learn a new tool and, and you don't want to waste your time. Um, and some, some things that are, are good to do is when you're doing benchmarks, it's, uh, it's helpful to run them on um, kind of like fixed hardware or publicly available hardware. Because if you run benchmarks on sort of your random uh, machine under your desk at, in your office, you know, with these certain hardware requirements, it's hard for other people to reproduce that. So um, it's, it's nice if when you run benchmarks to run them on something like an Amazon EC2 instance where everyone could possibly reproduce what you're doing. And also, it's kind of. Uh, there's a tradition of people benchmarking their own software. And um, you know, if you can imagine, there's, there's reasons why that's maybe not the best idea. I think every software author would want to benchmark their own tool. But there's issues when you do that if you're comparing against other tools that you don't maybe know as well or you're not as familiar with. There's kind of a bias there. So in theory, it would be nice if this was done by a third party. OK, so here's just some of the mistakes which I've touched upon a little bit. Um, in general, like a lot of the machine learning benchmarks that I've seen, there's, there's really not enough data sets and, and enough diversity within the data sets. And, and often the data sets are pretty small. So you know, like less than 5,000 rows or 10,000 rows. And there's no uh, benchmarking of, of bigger data sets. Um, and if that's your goal, just to understand how tools perform on small data sets, then that's good. Um, but anyway, here's just some other things that we've run into. Um, you know, using inappropriate metrics. So like if you have a binary classification problem and you maybe use accuracy instead of something like AUC or log loss, like that's not as informative. Um, and people tend to overgeneralize the results. So they do like a small little study and then make very large conclusions. 
And so I think why is this important for AutoML in particular? It's um, because AutoML, there's no reference algorithm. There's, we're all just coming up with new things, basically. So there's a number of different AutoML tools. And it's not like we're all trying to implement a random forest, and we know what a random forest is, and we know how to benchmark it. Um, so when we're tweaking the algorithm, it's possible that you think you're making improvements, but actually it's just improving on a few data sets. But across the board, it might be you know not improving. So I think at, in terms of when you're developing an AutoML system, uh, you need to constantly be benchmarking. And so this is just a little graph of um, some benchmarks uh, when I'm working on H2O AutoML. Um, you know, we we make new changes and we want to make sure that they improve the performance. So. Here's just three different versions, things that we did. One thing, we added XGBoost. The performance went up quite a lot. So across the board, we changed the validation strategy. The performance went up a little bit as well. So we want to make sure we're going in the upward direction. So this is a, so this is a, a repo for this benchmark system that we created. So this is a collaboration between different AutoML researchers and OpenML.org. And so openml.org is a platform for doing reproducible machine learning experiments where you have unique identifiers for data sets and tasks. And this is a, sort of a, becoming a common uh, resource for, for data sets that are used in benchmarks. And so tasks are defined by a data set with a response and then some evaluation method like tenfold cross-validation. Okay, so this is kind of just a summary of, of what our benchmark is. So we define a diverse collection of data sets. We built this uh, framework that uses Docker to kind of make things uh, more reproducible and you can execute it locally or on Amazon EC2. So we, we've added a few tools, but you could add your tool or another AutoML tool. It's easy to extend, so I think that's also important. We publish the results on the web, and then the idea is when there's a new version of one of these tools, we rerun the benchmarks and repost the stuff. And so this, this is just how we defined. So there's a lot of tools that sometimes are called AutoML, but this is how we defined what AutoML is to, to qualify for our benchmark. So basically, no hyperparameters. It has to be basic, basically one, one line of code where you don't touch anything, and then um, it has to return a model. Um, or optionally, a list of all the models that it tried. And then something that we felt was important for our benchmark is to be able to specify a resource constraint or, or time constraint. And I'm just going to show you what, is, what does an AutoML system look like. So this is the example, the one that I work on, called H2O AutoML, which is in the H2O package. It's just one line of code. You're pointing to your training set. You're saying, which column am I trying to predict? And then how long am I going to run this for? And then what we give back um, is what we call a leaderboard that ranks all the models that we've trained. And so this is just a list of some open source AutoML tools. These are kind of the most popular ones. Um, and the top four are the ones that we benchmarked in our, um, in our benchmark so far. Um, Auto SK Learn, which is on top of Scikit-Learn. Teapot is also on top of Scikit-Learn, but it's a different type of benchmark. Um, I didn't put the results because so I don't want to try to simplify the results. So if you want to look at um, all of them, or at least what we have now, there's a link there. But essentially, it's also important or useful to compare to some baseline like a random forest because you want to know like if you're doing all this fancy AutoML, is it actually outperforming something like a random forest? Um, this is a link to an archive paper. So we. Um, uh, there was an ICML workshop last month, and our paper was in the ICML workshop. So this will describe the framework and some of our results. I think I'm almost out of time, so I think that's my last slide. And um, I think, let me just check. Are we out of time? So it's questions? Yeah.
Thanks. You, you always have to set a certain runtime limit for the optimization, right? So you're always um, making some choice that would um, benefit or like um, would, would bias the result in one way or another for one framework that optimizes very quickly to a mediocre result and another one that optimizes slowly to a very good result. Do you have any thoughts on how to um, um, compare different kind of methods that have these kind of trade-offs? Yeah, so basically the, the answer is just do a lot of different benchmarks. So we in our results, we, we did one, we compared everything for running for one hour, four hours, eight hours, and then we also, you could change out the resources. So if you want it uh, like on a small machine with not that many CPUs versus a large machine, I think it's important to try at least some number of combinations of these things because the results can change. So if you're only running for, let's say, 30 minutes or an hour, that might be very different results than if you were allowing it to run for four hours. And so in your mind, you, you might have a use case that's more fitting for you. And so you'd want to only kind of look at those results and make a choice based on that. Anyone else? Hello. So uh, my question will be, because in, in your case, what you look for the model is like essentially performance, right? Mm -hmm. But if you prepare a model for production, it's very important to, uh, to check that the input data is actually stable and that you can actually rely on it uh, over time. So what is the way for these AutoML models to actually to choose which features should be used from stability point of view? Um, so, well, there's a couple things. One, one you could look at stability. The other, you could look at things like interpretability or amount of time to make a prediction if you're putting something into production. So some of them are able to, you can turn off ensembling. So if you want a more quick model at the end, um, you can do that. But um, in terms of uh, measuring the stability of the algorithm, I think I don't, uh, well, there's probably a lot of different ways that you could quantify that, but we didn't include that in our benchmark. So I think that would be kind of, you know, an extension or something that you could do on your own, or that could be another metric that we could measure against in the future. 